As a reviewer, one of the most frustrating things for me can be a potentially great printer with some really careless flaws that ultimately make it hard to recommend. However, from time to time, I do also come across surprisingly good printers from places you might not typically expect. Perhaps a little bit like this, the Chidi Q1 Pro, which they've sent me for review. I've not been paid, but it's technically still sponsored since they sent me the printer. And Dems the rules. The Q1 Pro is a fully enclosed Core XY FDM printer with active chamber heating, bimetallic hardened tip nozzle, 245 by 245 by 245 millimeter build volume that can heat up to 120 degrees Celsius on the bed and 350 degrees Celsius on the nozzle. They claim printer performance up to 600 millimeters per second speed and 20,000 millimeters per second squared acceleration. That seems quite a lot to promise for the 599 US dollar price tag. So let's find out if they've managed it. Before we start, I just want to let you know that Vector3D now has a new website at Vector3D.shop. We've got some offers on at the moment and I'm sure you'll love them. So be sure to head over there and check out our LEDs, CNC Kitchen, official stuff, VLMP and other cool things that we've designed. The Q1 Pro is a pretty large machine but the packaging is made of hard polystyrene, which isn't a great choice since after a single impact, it's about as much use as a chocolate teapot. The whole industry has been using black closed cell foam for a while, so I've no idea why Chidi is still living like it's 1999. After unboxing, the initial setup is reasonably smooth. The screen on the front will guide you through some of the unpackaging and setup, but crucially, misses Wi-Fi, which seems like a pretty major oversight, considering that with Clipper and Fluid installed, you should really be using the network connectivity features that it comes with. With the printer running, let's have a quick look over what we've got. Looking around the outside, the first thing I noticed is how plasticky and large the outer shell is. In my opinion, it looks kind of ugly and cheap as a result, which is a bit of a shame. We also find the power connection on the back, USB on the top, screen on the front and an SSR for the chamber heater on the bottom. Just be warned, there's high voltage LIN side, so please do not touch. The spool holder attaches to the back panel and sticks out the side. It is possibly the wobbliest design I've ever seen, but at least it's not right on the back. As we try to open the door to look inside, it's immediately obvious that there isn't a door handle. I'd say that's mildly inconvenient, but I suppose it's easy enough to fix. Upon inspection, we find steel rods for the motion system, a fairly large tool head for the direct drive extruder and hot end, a USB camera, dual Z lead screw motion system, PEI flex plate, and the steel frame, which makes up the core of the printer. Notably too, we see a tiny little heater in the back corner, which should help heat up the enclosure. Doing a disassembly of the tool head, the first thing I noticed is that maintenance and access to these parts seems to be really pretty good. The hot end and extruder can be removed from the machine as a single unit with minimal fuss. The extruder is based on an LGX type design with fixed tension and a filament sensor at the top. One interesting feature to note is that they use a helical gear from the stepper motor. The hot end fixes to the extruder with two screws and is a similar form factor to the Bamboo Labs X1C, but with a larger round nickel plated block instead. The nozzle is similar to an E3D Volcano, but a few millimeters shorter. So for a perfect fit, you'll have to buy the Chidi nozzles. Taking the back paddle off to see the electronics, we find the main control board and power supply. The main board is made by MakerBase, a typical OEM designer, and based on the MKS SKIPR by the looks of it, with a single board computer integrated into the main board and using eMMC memory. The power supply seems to be a fairly generic design by Mornsun. It's a 350 watt, 24 volt unit. The wiring is a little bit messy, but there's plenty of space back there and nothing looks dangerously designed particularly, although the wires in the screw terminals should ideally not be soldered. Looking at the tool head electronics, we notice a fan hole without a fan, but after removing the cover, unsurprisingly find an MKS-based tool headboard. 
Most of the connectors here are JST XH, so that should certainly help in terms of maintenance and having to recrimp things if needed. The cable used for communication and power is terminated at a PCB and secured in place with a zip tie. It looks a little bit weird and out of place, but actually probably in terms of maintenance, a fairly good design as you should be able to like resolder and whatever if you need to. Then for the firmware that runs the printer, this is where things really fall apart. It runs Clipper and Fluid, has Clipper screen installed, and even runs the Clipper installer and update helper, or Kiao. However, the version of Clipper that they run is two years and five months old. They've also made a bunch of weird modifications, presumably for their kind of bad touch user interface, and as a result, you can't update any of it. So from day one of owning your printer, you're already two years out of date and you can't do anything about it. Ironic, given the update helper comes pre-installed. No single part of this is acceptable, in my opinion. Make your modification a plugin so that everything else can still be updated and so that your terrible modifications can be removed and ignored. Vanilla Clipper is best Clipper, so stop messing around with it. At least you can get SSH access with the standard MakerBase credentials, though. While we're looking at weird decisions, you remember I said that there's no setup for Wi-Fi? Well, it turns out the board doesn't actually have Wi-Fi itself. It's just a plug-in USB adapter. If you're limited to Wi-Fi only, you could use it, but this is a pro machine, so I'd expect more. Well, the specs they sent me says it actually has Ethernet, so maybe we'll just use that. Except it doesn't. The hardware components have not been fitted to the control board. However, if you have a little look, under the label on the back panel, you'll find a square hole with some small mounting holes either side. Exactly where the Ethernet port should go. So I purchased an Ethernet panel mount and USB to Ethernet adapter, plugged it in, and it works. Not in every USB port mind, and you have to unplug the Wi-Fi, but it does work. Lastly, you can't just go directly to the printer's IP address like with every other clipper machine ever. You have to add 10,088 as a port. Why? I really don't know. But wait, there's more! The chamber heater we mentioned earlier should be a great benefit, but it doesn't do anything by default because it's not been set up properly. When set manually on the web interface, it does work pretty well though. When enabled with the heated bed at 100 and the chamber at 60, it gets to that 60 degrees in around 16 minutes, which I think is quite impressive really. The unload filament button just tells you to cut it and then it purges for ages which seems kind of wasteful when you could just do a retraction. The camera works although the lighting has no baffles or diffusion so really poorly affects the final visual quality. Lastly the touchscreen on the front is not very intuitive and is resistive rather than capacitive so not exactly a premium or pro experience. Okay let's take a breath from ranting now and look at how the printer actually performs. Maybe lots of weirdness can be forgiven, probably not, if the final results speak for themselves. And actually, they kind of do a bit sometimes. Since it's an enclosed machine, all the prints I'm showing here are done in ABS, but I have been using the machine for other projects too, using PLA, just make sure to keep the top and door open. As it starts to print, you'll notice the nozzle pad and purge bucket at the back of the printer. From my usage so far, this seems to work quite well, despite being a little bit wobbly. However, the bucket is quite small, so remember to empty it regularly and definitely do it before printing, as once you start, it's trapped behind the bed and you won't be able to get to it. With the Autodesk test model, we got some warping due to the 90 degrees C default bed temperature, but other than that, it's a pretty good print. All the clearance gauges came loose or pushed out gently. The overhangs look good, Bridging looks very reasonable, and there's no obvious signs of Z banding type issues. There is a little bit of wispy stringing on the top spikes, but nothing a bit of heat can't resolve. With my Kali Lantern skew test and calibration file, I found some pretty skewed axes ranging from 0.14 to 0.18 degrees, although we were able to correct for this using the skew calculator. With the Gaia Anderson cap model, the surfaces are smooth, the details are visible, there's minimal stringing and the support pulled away easily. With the first layer test, the largest square the slicer would accept was 232 by 232 millimeters. 
presumably due to a reservation of space for purging. Nevertheless, it came out really well. A great first layer all the way across the build plate, but unfortunately this isn't something that was actually perfect every time in actual printing, which is a bit weird. When it comes to the slicer settings themselves, despite boasting about 20k acceleration and 600mm per second printing speed, the slicer settings they provide for this specific printer topped out at 10k acceleration and 270 for 0.2mm layers up to 420 for the finest 0.12mm layers. Not really even close to what was promised, although they do generally result in some good prints. The individual material settings are okay, but they're kind of lacking chamber temperatures, and the chosen ones that they do have do seem a little bit off, in my opinion. In summary, despite its cheap and tacky appearance, the steel frame does its job, and in combination with some reasonable print profiles, it does achieve some pretty good prints. If you're after a ready-to-run machine for printing warp-pro materials like ABS and ASA, then you should be able to get many good prints off this machine. If you're keen to support open source work, then this is not a printer you should buy, since there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement of open source provided, nor is the modified firmware available, despite them using it extensively to run pretty much every part of this machine. For the 599 US dollar price point, they seem to be competing with Bamboo Labs P1S. I don't have one, but I do have an X1C, which is kind of a bit similar. If Chidi hadn't messed up the firmware so much, I'd probably consider picking this up over a P1S. In the future, if they remove their bad UI and revert to clipper screen or guppy with a vanilla clipper install that actually updates, it starts to look like a much better proposition. There are quite a few little annoyances with this printer, but if you don't think they'll bother you or you're able to fix them, then the Chidi Q1 Pro might be something worth looking into as your next printer. Also, AMS when?